All right. Um, thank you, everyone. So um, I think it's the time uh, we start. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Gina Francis Makwabe. I'm the consultant physician and nephrologist working with Africa Healthcare Network in Tanzania. Um, I'll be chairing this session with Dr. Ntarindwa Joseph, who is a consultant physician and nephrologist from Rwanda. Uh, he's also working with Africa Healthcare Network in Rwanda. So um, today uh, we are lucky that, you know, uh, the presenter for today's topic is very well known to us and to most of the nephrologists here in the panel. And um, he had uh, presented in this forum before a couple of months ago. And therefore, uh, the topic today will be climate change and nephrology. How should we respond? And it's a great honor to introduce uh, to you uh, Professor Vivek Jha, uh, who is a former president of the International Society of Nephrology from 2019 to 2021. He's also a chair of Global uh, Kidney Health, Faculty of Medicine, Imperial College of London, and also executive director, the George Institute of Global Health in, I mean, in India. He's a professor of nephrology, head of the department of transitional and uh, regenerative medicine, postgraduate institute of medical education and research, Chandigarh, India. Uh, professor Jha uh, Vivek, you are warmly welcome and the floor is yours. Thank you for joining. Thank you. Dr. Regina for that very kind introduction and I'd like to thank once again uh, my very old friend Lloyd Vincent and Nick for inviting me to join you again this uh, evening your time, uh, late evening my time and talk to you on a very uh, relevant topic uh, that should concern us and it actually is indeed of concern to the entire humanity but uh, let's try and see why it should it concern us as nephrologists as well. So I will take perhaps a second to share my screen. Uh, I'm gonna talk to you over the next 20, 25 minutes or so about uh, climate change in the kidneys and what should we do as nephrology community and hopefully after that, uh, uh, I hope to have some robust discussion from you, hear some ideas because this, this is relevant and we need to think out, out of the box. So I don't think I need to remind anyone unless you lived under a rock for the last two years or landed from Mars uh, just now uh, that we are currently in uh, the times that is defined by the coronavirus. I am pretty sure again, uh, for those who like to read about these kind of things, a strong link has been suspected between the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic and uh, climate change, and all the changes that climate change has, uh, you know, uh, has produced. Uh, the lab leak hypothesis is still being pursued, but I think increasingly it's fair to say that the consensus is veering towards this being a random uh, event that has happened and might be strongly linked to climate change. So it might be a good idea to start with the basics because we are all nephrologists and often uh, we get too immersed in our own speciality and it becomes uh, uh, somewhat difficult even to uh, look at things from a uh, 40,000 foot view. So climate change is uh, basically the, uh, is the global phenomenon uh, of climate transformation, which is characterized by the changes in the usual climate of the planet in terms of temperature, precipitation, and wind speed. And the last bit is important, and these are especially caused by human activities. So who is responsible for climate change? It is us who are responsible for climate change. Uh, it is uh, our um, elders who have uh, bequeathed the world that we live in, and it is us who will, who will leave the world for our children. And so therefore it is our responsibility as, uh, as you know, humans that we, we look at this as an important issue and, and, and see what, what kind of world we want to leave for our children. I also want to just distinguish these two commonly used terms, climate change and global warming. So global warming is the phenomenon of uh, the rising surface temperature of the earth. Uh, which is due mainly to increasing concentration of greenhouse gases. 
which are also emitted mostly by activities that are caused by humans. Whereas climate change is an increasing change in the various measures of climate over a long period of time, which one of which is, uh, is temperature, which is reflected in global warming, but also includes precipitation wind patterns, as I said before. I am sure that it doesn't come as a surprise to anyone on this call that uh, climate change has been now called as the greatest public health challenge of the 21st century, and a number of uh, social civil society organizations. So climate change has been caused as the greatest public health challenge of the 21st century, and we must find solutions to this together. As I said before, the, the species that, is, that has been held responsible for climate change are us, the humans. And therefore, this epoch has also been labeled as the Anthropocene. Right? So anthro what is Anthropocene? Anthropocene is a proposed geological epoch, which is dating from the commencement of significant human impact on Earth's geology and ecosystems including but not limited to the human caused climate change. Now let's just pivot from general description of climate change to what are the health threats from climate change. And we are talking only about major health. And so the major health threats from climate change are, you know, can be captured under the following bullet points. Uh, changing disease patterns. Uh, there is an increasing water and food insecurity amongst um, many populations in different parts of the world. Uh, air pollution is something that most of us have experienced in a quite a visible manner. Extreme climatic events are being reported increasingly from various parts of the world, whether they are uh, extreme rain events, uh, forest fires, uh, and um, landslides, hurricanes, etc. They are all being reported increasingly almost on uh, year after year you can see the increasing uh, frequency of these events taking place and what it leads to is eventually displacement of population and uh, uh, purport disproportionately affecting the people who are already disadvantaged and making them even further disadvantaged. This particular graph taken from our World in Data website which is one of the uh, one of the most commonly accessed websites for uh, looking at a visual depiction of various uh, various events that that are taking place uh, on, on on in our world and so you can see from 1970 to 2019 the reported natural disasters the overall number by the uh, length of these bars you, which you can see i don't think there is any reason for me to describe has been increasing in the length but also the various components. So you can see uh, floods uh, are the biggest component shown in blue. And then you have extreme weather in rust color. And then you have drought in lighter blue, extreme temperature in light orange, earthquake in purple, landslides in, in green, and then wildfires in uh, orange, volcanic activity, mass movements, impact, etc. So you can see all of them have been increasing in number uh, over the over the course of years that we have been living in, and climate change uh, has uh, been linked very very closely now with non-communicable diseases. Uh, if you follow the Global Health Journal Lancet, almost every second or third issue has an article on some aspect of climate, uh, some aspect of health and climate change. Uh, this, this figure is not taken from one of those publications, but has been taken from the Annual Review of Public Health. And it shows you the pathway that climate change can take to impact non-communicable diseases. So it can have direct health impacts, the climate change, uh, which again, as I said, uh, you know, uh, increasing variability, extreme weather events, heat waves. So the direct uh, heat health impacts are in the form of injury, death, uh, post-event traumatic stress and disease risk. But then there are environmental and social impacts which indirectly impact on health. And these are you know, uh, glacier loss. So just a few weeks ago, for the first time ever, uh, there was rain on the North Pole. Uh, there is altered surface water. There is a reduction in food yield. Uh, ecosystem is getting damaged. There is property loss. There, are, there is effect on tourist, tourism and recreation. There is infrastructure damage. All, and, and the climate change also directly leads to a change in biodiversity, global biodiversity. 
the so what is biodiversity uh, it is actually the change in microbial e ecology that we have which include animals vectors and pathogens and we'll talk a little bit more about it uh, in a couple of minutes this leads to global shortages of uh, fresh water food etc and uh, increase in prices etc which makes it harder for people to access these things and make the, makes them rare commodities and then the, all of this leads to indirect health impacts in the form of uh, degradation of hygiene and loss of homegrown food, uh, worsening of nutrition, child development, uh, loss of community and family morale, infectious disease risk goes up, and there is uh, mental health issues, etc. Et People, uh, there, there are conflicts and displacements as a result of uh, uh, scarcity, which leads to relocation of people, and all of this has a health impact. So you can see the the cascading events that uh, lead to health impact. So having just, uh, you know, slowly now approaching from the 40,000 view to a much closer view of the kidneys. So how does climate change affect the kidneys? It can lead to a direct heat related kidney disease. Kidney diseases can also be related to changing biodiversity and, uh, uh, and the, the ecology that, uh, that we have uh, on our earth. And then there are other types of kidney diseases which are related to extreme weather events. So this uh, particular picture shows you uh, the heat wave time series starting from 1950. This is very compressed and you can see the number of heat wave days uh, starting from 1950 to 2010. And on the second uh, on graph on the right side, you can look at the longest duration uh, of heat wave in terms of the number of days. And on both the graphs, you can see in dark blue line is the, is the average and each color indicates different, uh, different parts of the world, uh, which you can see here, you know. Uh, and I think you can see slowly bit, but inexorably the number of heat, total number of heat wave days and the longest duration of heat wave in each year has been rising over the last 60 to 70 years on the earth. So heat, what can heat do to the kidneys? Heat can cause three main kinds of kidney injury. One is acute kidney injury, second is chronic kidney disease, and third is increasing incidence of kidney stones. And all of these were shown in this particular paper, which looked at the relationship between daily maximum temperatures and hospital inpatient renal admissions in one hospital in Adelaide in Australia. They looked at all kidney diseases. You can see when the, the days when the x-axis shows the maximum temperature, you know, on that particular day. And on the y-axis, you can see mean daily admissions. And here you can see a very, very strong uh, uh, link between the, the maximum temperature and the daily admissions for all kidney diseases, stone diseases, chronic kidney disease and acute kidney injury. Here you can see a somewhat weaker association, uh, but similar, uh, more or less similar pattern with chronic kidney disease, urinary tract infection, uh, total urinary tract infection, lower urinary tract infection and pyelonephritis. So even if infections go up during the times when the temperatures are higher. So, so I think the, the relationship cannot be, these are all associative but I think the circumstantial evidence is extremely strong. So what is the mechanism of heat stress induced kidney injury? We are all interested in finding that out. So heat stress and in um, countries that you live in, in African continent and the country that I live in, in India, where we have a large proportion of rural folks, uh, all of these people go out and work in the fields, whether it is hot or cold, they have to go out and work and they, they are getting exposed to heat stress, they sometimes overexert, and they are often faced with water shortages. And as a result, during the period, during, and, and they're engaged in strenuous work, which leads to rhabdomyolysis, it causes hyperosmol, urinary hyperosmolality. Often they also experience hyperthermia or, or heat stroke. And uh, needless to say, they all become volume depleted, which, which will all together lead to kidney injury. There are a number of other things also that can happen. So for example, uh, because of volume depletion, there is vasopressin activation. Uh, there is, uh, there is uh, overactivation of the Aldo's reductase system uh, because of uh, super concentration of urea in the, in the tubules, there is uric acid crystalluria. There is hypokalemia, which also induces renal vasoconstriction. 
and because of volume depletion, there is a reduction in renal blood flow. And all of them together uh, uh, increase the risk of development of acute kidney injury. And this is something which you saw already, the increased natural disaster. And these natural disasters are now being seen almost in all parts of the world. This is a picture taken from one of the cities in India, Chennai, which is uh, in South India. Uh, it, it's, it's a coastal city and it is now experiencing the kind of rain events which were not seen in the past. So uh, heavy rains uh, which, which come in bursts and actually drown the city. And during the times which are in between these rainy seasons, this, this city is faced with extreme water scarcity. So you can imagine this, uh, this kind of swing. And what it does, these kind of rainy events, is an increase in uh, flow of water like this. And in, in cities, you can see water stagnated, sometimes in puddles. And this stagnant water in hot and humid environment with uh, somewhat in, uh, increased salinity is a perfect nidus for growth of disease-causing vectors like mosquitoes and ticks and also is very, very hospitable for parasites like the plasmodium uh, malaria parasite here, you can see in a blood smear on the bottom left and the various viruses. They look beautiful on electron microscopy, especially when artificially colored, but we all are living through one viral pandemic and we, can, we all know what kind of havoc can be wrong. So how does it affect a practicing clinician? As a practicing clinician in India, and I'm sure uh, the story is not very different in Africa where you all work, that we often encounter patients who present to hospital emergencies with a febrile illness and along with febrile illness, they often have acute kidney injury. So at that time, we are faced with uh, the uh, dilemma of identifying what is the cause that is, that is responsible for this acute febrile illness. And there we need to often rely on our judgment by identifying the clinical syndrome. So a patient can present with fever or jaundice or the, fe the, the fever could be a straight fever or it could be what so-called biphasic fever and could be associated with conjunctival suffusion, thrombocytopenia and transaminitis, which is really uh, very, very characteristic of leptospirosis. If you only see fever and jaundice, there are uh, there are a number of conditions which can uh, produce this presentation. But if the fever is continuous and if there is severe respiratory syndrome leading to ARDS, hantavirus is quite possible. If there is severe myalgia with thrombocytopenia and acalculus cholecystitis, dengue becomes a strong possibility. If you can identify maculopapular rash, if the person is light skinned, uh, which many people are not in India uh, and in Africa as well. And if you can identify the Eshkar, then strep typhus assumes the primacy in the list of diagnosis. Fever, splenomegaly, thrombocytopenia is classically described as pathognomonic of malaria. We have exposure to unpasteurized milk products, much less common now, but it was much more common when I was a fellow and brucellosis was the condition we suspected. And we all are very, very familiar with bacterial or viral gastroenteritis. And so this is how we often make clinical distinctions but of course, laboratory tests are not easily available in many places. Then kidney stones. It is not very uncommon for us to encounter patients who come with unexplained kidney failure, do a straight X-ray abdomen, and this is what you see. So, and, and these are people who, who are unfortunately, again, uh, uh, people who have been working outdoors. They have experienced heat associated setting for many, many years, reduced volume, uh, urinary volume, leading to urinary supersaturation, and slow precipitation of these uh, chemicals leading to uh, development of kidney stones, even going on to stack on calculi. Nephrolithiasis risk is, has been shown to be increased in all parts of the world along with increasing temperature. So there is data from one study which showed 36 to 39% increased stone risk if the mean temperature was 30 degrees Celsius compared to if the mean temperature was 10 degrees Celsius. And another study from Korea showed a two and a half times increase in risk when the daily temperature was 29 degrees Celsius compared to when it was 13 degrees Celsius. And I'm sure all of you uh, have heard of CKD of unknown etiology. And CKD of unknown etiology has been linked very, very strongly to heat stress. 
especially in the Mesoamerican countries or Central American countries shown here on the left side of this particular uh, map, uh, Mexico, Guatemala, El Salvador, Nicaragua, Costa Rica, and Panama. But it has been identified in many other parts of the world, including in shown in this map in, in a few African countries, but I'm pretty sure it is much more widespread than what has been shown in this map. And it has also been described from my country, India, Sri Lanka, and many Southeast Asian countries as well. What is common in these countries? These are the countries where all 12 months of mean temperatures above 18 degrees Celsius. So you can see, you know, these are the same countries where you have uh, increasing uh, reports of CKDU. So that uh, more or less uh, uh, following the link. And these are the same countries where global water scarcity has also been predicted. It's been predicted that by the year 2025, more than half of the world population will reside in water stressed areas. And according to this particular paper by a number of colleagues in which I also had the opportunity to contribute, uh, the hypothesis which has been put forward is that heat stress, water shortage and over uh, uh, su supported by sweating leads to low grade rhabdomyolysis, hyperosmolarity, hyperthermia, extracellular volume depletion, I think we discussed this a few slides ago as well, which leads to vasopressin effect on kidney tubules, fructose metabolism, very, very favorite of Dr. David Johnson, uricosuria, renal ischemia, leading to repeated episodes of acute kidney injury. This is very important. So these people pretty much experience one episode of acute kidney injury every single day. So they go out in the morning, go out to work, experience an episode of acute kidney injury, and maybe recover partly over the course of the night, and then they go out again and experience another one, which over a period of time leads to chronic interstitial fibrosis. Climate change has also been linked very, very closely to increased human infections. And this is a map that was drawn uh, by, uh, by you know, a number of uh, researchers, uh, which shows the link between a number of events and how it can lead to change in biodiversity and, and uh, dis various diseases. So if you look at the history of pandemics, we know that there has been a gradual increase in the number of pandemics and five of the worst pandemics of the world have actually been uh, encountered by humanity in the last 20 years. But the actual increase in pandemic has uh, in, in those uh, infectious diseases uh, outbreaks. So this is, uh, has been, this is this particular graph uh, plots infectious diseases in terms of outbreaks shown here in the red dots and the red line and these outbreaks which cause a disease in the, in the blue line. So uh, of course diseases are somewhat slower but you can see how they have been going up from the 1960s and the much steeper climb in the year 2000 onwards. COVID-19 again I, I don't think I will spend too much time over it but we know that chronic kidney disease and organ transplant increase the risk of death in, of COVID-19 and this this was one one such uh, study which showed that a reduced kidney function or organ transplant had one of the greatest increases in the hazard ratio of developing organ dysfunction and death in COVID-19. COVID-19 and acute kidney injury well established Although the initial report showed uh, a low incidence of acute kidney injury, later on it shot up uh, with some, uh, some centers reporting more than 50% acute kidney injury in ICU patients in the first wave. But in the second wave, uh, it's, it's become much less. It is perhaps because we now know better how to manage patients with COVID-19, uh, especially volume uh, depletion is not as severe as was being done in the first wave when these patients, just because they uh, they were becoming um, dependent on vol on ventilators, they were being over uh, over diuresed and practically dehydrated, which led to increased incidence of acute kidney injury uh, uh, in those individuals. The question is, who are the most vulnerable? Which are the most vulnerable parts of the world? And you you don't need to go further than this map, which shows the more vulnerable populations in different shades of brown and red, and as you can see, the most vulnerable countries are uh, the countries where you live and the countries where I live and some of my neighbors. Uh, so Africa, South Asia, Southeast Asia, these are the most vulnerable countries. That was at the level of the country, but at an individual level, who are the people who are most vulnerable to climate change related kidney diseases? 
So they are the children, the elderly, those with pre-existing chronic kidney diseases, those who are manual workers and who work outdoors, such as construction workers or agricultural laborers, those who have been taking over-the-counter medicines like nonsteroidal anti-inflammatory agents, uh, angiotensin blockers, diuretics, and now SGLT2 inhibitors. And those, most importantly, in the end, again, important for you and me, is those with reduced access to healthcare, those who are unable to go and seek care for themselves. And this is what you can see in this picture, which, uh, which appeared in the cover of Kidney International in the year 2007. This is a picture uh, from an earthquake devastated area of Pakistan, uh, where uh, there was no way to get, and here you can see a patient who requires dialysis, developed crush syndrome as a result of earthquake. And this patient is carried, being literally being carried uh, on, on, on a cart by several people manually, literally to a hospital where this patient may get some care. So that's, that's the challenge of people who don't have access to care. And we know that these disadvantaged people are particularly vulnerable to being dis disenfranchised from any kind of care. And we showed during COVID-19 how people with, uh, with kidney failure who required dialysis, who were on dialysis, were unable to get dialysis just because uh, they, uh, the COVID-19 uh, severely affected their care. So we have, we have spoken a lot about what is wrong and what can go wrong further, but what is it that we can do? We can still do a lot as community and we must do a lot. So there are two uh, approaches, general approaches to building climate resilience. One is called mitigation and the other is called adaptation. So what is mitigation? Mitigation is all that is being done by the countries uh, in order to reduce emissions that cause climate change. So all the countries, the treaties that you see, the Paris Climate Treaty and the COP26 summit that will happen in a few weeks, it was all about developing policies that will lead to reduction in emission. And that can be done only by governments and policymakers. So sustainable transportation, clean energy, energy efficiency, but also a number of things shown here in, in the two, you know, in the overlapping part of these two circles. And then is adaptation. What is adaptation? Adaptations are actions that we can take to manage the risk of climate change impact. So climate change has already happened, but there are things that we can do to reduce the impact of this climate change. And this could be, you know, uh, as a result of developing flood, flood protection, infrastructure upgrades, uh, improving food systems, uh, in, making communities complete, uh, developing urban forests, so green spaces in cities, water conservation, and so on and so forth. So these are the two general approaches. So mitigation, as I said, is something that needs to be done at the level of policy, but we should recognize that there are a number of unintended co-benefits which will help kidney health. Uh, even if we don't think of uh, kidney health while deciding on mitigation strategies. So there are two examples shown here. So let's say, as a result of mitigation. So we know that consumption of animal food, especially beef uh, is, uh, uh, is very, very deleterious for climate change because there is a lot of uh, greenhouse gas emission associated with, with it. So there is uh, a strong push to adopt a vegetarian diet, vegan diet, green vegetables, et cetera. But we do know that consumption of plant-based diet is favorable for kidney health as well. So we don't do it just to protect kidneys, but there will be co-benefits on kidney health. Similarly, uh, we, uh, as mitigation strategies, we do promote the use of uh, the the use of uh, less use of motorized vehicles and more use of personal transport, such as bicycles or walking, etc. And we all again know that increased physical activities, such as cycling, etc., have benefits on kidney health as well. Nephrologists also have a role in mitigation and. I'm sure many of you would have heard of the green nephrology initiatives being taken by a number of uh, nephrology societies because dialysis units are one of the greatest, uh, greatest generators of carbon emissions. And this is something which, which, which was shown in this particular uh, paper uh, and, and that in hemodialysis, uh, we generate 390 kilos of total waste per patient, 101 kilos of uh, uh, PVC, in peritoneal dialysis, even greater, 617 kilos of total waste, out of which 343 kilo is PVC. And in, in the UK and NHS, hemodialysis and peritoneal dialysis are actually responsible for almost one third 
a few case total fuel for waste. There are disposable issues, uh, in, in, in incineration leads to emission, and uh, there is a huge amount of cost involved. And uh, when you dispose of PVC, you lead to release of toxic chemicals. But then there are a number of reduction strategies we, which we can take as nephrologists. We should segregate our waste, we should recycle pack packaging, and we should substitute hazardous materials and remove the PVC products. We can take a number of other kidney specific adaptation measures by promoting behavior change, implement preventive measures to promote kidney health. We should monitor kidney function in vulnerable groups, very, very important. So these are people who have no choice but to work outdoors because they have to make a living. So the, the community has the responsibility to monitor their kidney function. We should make sure that these people, as has been done actually in certain countries in the Central American um, part of the world, uh, remain well hydrated and they get shade breaks so that they, uh, they don't get exposed to heat stress on a continuous basis. Their working hours should be limited and they should be given uh, rest, uh, increased rest. And of course, because water quality is important and poor water quality, which will degrade further if the climate change continues, uh, is responsible for increased gastroenteritic illnesses. And so we must enforce water quality standards. There are other things also which we can do. For example, uh, the biodiversity degradation will increase to the number of mosquitoes and those mosquitoes actually will also now go to areas of the world where there were no mosquitoes before, for example, in Western Europe, etc. So maybe they will also have to adopt the use of mosquito nets, which are common in Africa and Asia. Uh, use of uh, protective equipment for farm workers, uh, making sure that we have um, traps like this that can cause disease causing, causing vectors and, uh, and, and other types of uh, good storage of food facilities because the, even this can lead to uh, breeding of vectors, etc. And then we need to also develop sustainable programs for treating acute kidney injuries such as Saving Young Lives, which has been active in Africa for a large number of years. We also need uh, the global communities to increase research and funding on climate change related kidney diseases. So that's something which is very important and we need to advocate for it. We need to work work uh, with our allies, our allies in, uh, in the press, because we have to continue to highlight uh, the, in, the, the grievous Im adverse impact of climate change and kidney health, such as this report, which, which appeared in uh, thinkglobalhealth.org. So therefore, uh, my dear friends, in conclusion, I would say that climate change is the greatest public health threat of the 21st century. It has direct and indirect implications on kidney health, Kidney care will be affected by climate change. Low resource settings and vulnerable groups in high income countries also are at highest risk. Climate change mitigation strategies will produce kidney health co-benefits. So we should also energetically participate in these mitigation strategies. As community, nephrologist community, we should look for opportunities to, to adopt kidney specific adaptation strategies. And we need to do more research find more funding, and we also need to do more advocacy. So I'm going to stop here and invite questions. Thank you very much, Professor Vivek. That was excellent talk. And actually, we learned a lot, because when I was uh, reading this topic before your presentation, I was saying, so what is he going to cover? <laughs> so this is a very wide topic, and I've learned um, a lot. So it's the time for questions and answers. And um, my comment. Uh, Professor Vivek is, uh, you know, uh, as you clearly pointed out, that the most vulnerable populations are Africa, Asia, some parts of Asia and Southeast Asia. But these are the countries that are really contributing less in the climate change in terms of environmental pollution and those kind of things. Um, big countries like Europe and in, in Europe and USA. They are the ones who are actually contributing much in the environmental degradation, climate change. And yet, because of the resources, they are able to protect the people. But uh, we poor countries, we are not. Therefore, you know, it will be very difficult if we, as the world, we don't involve these big countries who are emitting this, uh, you know, who are doing pollutions, rather than concentrating in, in small African countries and, and some Asian countries. So. 
one of my question is, can you please explain the, you, you, it, during your ELF presentation, the ELF slides, you talked about anthro, uh, uh, anthropocene. Anthropocene. I don't know what, what does it mean clearly when you are. So anthropos is human, you know, human related. So and scene is this particular period of time that we are living in. So the period of time that we are living in, which is severely affected by human activities is what we mean by Anthropocene. So it's now, it's been established beyond doubt, although there are doubters in all parts of the world, especially in US where this issue became extremely political, that the climate change, you know, the climate change that we have been experiencing is mostly as a result of human activity. So as a result of this, it makes sense to call the current epoch as Anthropocene. So that is what it means, this word. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Um, any other comments or questions from the audience? There is, there is, a, there is, a, there is a question from uh, Professor Ifoma Olasi. Uh, yeah. she, go ahead, Ifoma. Oh, thank you very much, uh, Vivek. Wonderful lecture, very illuminating. I enjoyed it thoroughly. I was uh, asking, follow up to the chairman's uh, uh, comments. What part should governments play in both mitigation and adaptation strategies? Because I feel government has a whole lot to play. And when we talk about government, we also talk about the um, organizations like uh, WHO, UNICEF, and all that. We need to do something because at the rate we are going, <laughs> I don't know what we're going to leave for our children. Thank you. So, uh, Ifoma, thank you. I think very perceptive comment as usual. Uh, you know, uh, you are exactly right that uh, uh, governments have central role to play in this. Uh, if the government doesn't do anything, then we are all doomed. Uh, all the current treaties that uh, that have uh, uh, that have been signed by the various governments uh, really talk about the mitigation strategies around climate change. Uh, so governments have a central role, and I would say. Uh, if I have to identify which are the uh, agencies that are responsible for mitigation, number one is government, number two is government, number three is government, and number 10 is government, you know? So all uh, the most important, uh, uh, most important actions have to be taken by the governments. But uh, as, the, as Mr. Chairman was uh, mentioning in his remarks, that the governments have a number of excuses, you know, as to why they should not do it, especially the high income countries government. Uh, and because they have the power, you know, they have the power, so they're able to get their ways. So it is up to the rest of the world to hold their feet to the fire, so to speak. Uh, may not be the best uh, metaphor to use in a climate change conversation, uh, but the rest of the, the civil society groups, they have to continue to speak up which includes the medical community as well. Uh, we know that we are, we, are, we are not activists by nature, but at one point of time, we do need to adopt uh, in some activist stance and talk about what needs to be done because as I said before, and it has been expressed by a number of uh, renowned people that climate change is the greatest threat to health. So if we don't talk about it, then who will? So, you know, we need to come together and impress upon a, on our governments. And the responsibility lies more with uh, the high income country governments, but also other go governments, for example, other large, ambitious large countries like China, like India, like Nigeria, uh, many such countries, these are large countries and we are ambitious countries. Uh, so while we do seek to achieve economic growth at that time, because we have learned lessons from the rest of the world, uh, we do need to also work with our governments to ensure that responsible policies are implemented in our countries. Thank you, Prof. I can see the hand from uh, Rahendra Vima. Uh, thanks, Jana. Um, thank you very much. Um, good evening, uh, Dr. Jaff from South Africa. Uh, excellent talk. I really, really enjoyed it. And uh, I think this is a very, very important issue. So I'm a pediatrician, so I mean, and you know that. <laughs> so the thing is, I'm going to ask a question that uh, is going to impact on children. We are seeing a major epidemiological transition in, in the spectrum of diseases in children, both 
infectious and non-communicable diseases. And when, we, when you look at the literature, things like hypertension development of um, FSGS, etc., you know, particularly in kidney disease, it's just rising exponentially. I mean, we just had a recent uh, review of our patients with nephrotic syndrome, and we found that in our patients, I mean, the incidence of FSGS increased from 5% in the 70s to now about 69%, close to 70, I mean, it's 70%. So a lot of it we are blaming on lifestyle changes, diet, etc. But I think some of it may be in fact due to climate change. What is your view on that? No, I have no doubt that you're exactly right. Uh, you know, climate change, I'm pretty sure, has, uh, has produced many changes, uh, which includes changes in food, changes in um, the epidemiological exposure of children to the various uh, insults, infectious disease insults, environmental insults. Uh, our ch the children of today are much more sedentary compared to the children even of 20 years ago. Uh, that has a major impact, as we all know. Uh, children today have greater, young children, especially even toddlers, they have greater access to energy-dense foods. And we know that uh, when uh, children become, or, or, or infants become obese, that obesity increase in the number of fat cells doesn't go away. You know, it all, they, those fat cells always stay there. And so they are, the, the, the fat child is going to become the fat adult. Uh, the third thing is uh, the, uh, the maternal malnutrition, which leads to low birth weight babies. And then suddenly when they are exposed to plenty, I think it's been shown by uh, a number of studies and that that's a very, very toxic combination. So there are a number of things and we can, we can actually discuss that, that, that itself may be a full talk. Uh, but, you know, all and all of these food security is extremely important uh, um, and directly linked to climate change. Uh, there are studies from Bangladesh uh, which have shown that uh, the, the incursion of seawater into the aquifers is leading to increase in salinity of drinking water. And that increased salinity leads to increase in the incidence of pregnancy-induced hypertension. That pregnancy-induced hypertension has an effect on the fetus and the babies who are born, who become, you know, uh, more prone to develop chronic diseases later in life. So it's, it's a very, very vicious cycle and we are learning more and more. The impact of, uh, the impact of uh, air pollution on, um, on, on the growth of lungs in children, uh, both indoor air pollution and outdoor air pollution. So outdoor air pollution may be more important for Western countries, but uh, in, for developing countries, again, in your country, in my country, indoor air pollutions are extremely important. So we have, we, had a, we have a number of things to discuss here. Thanks, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Professor Sarana Naika, I've seen your hand. Please. Ah, thank you very much. <laughs> Vivek, I must just echo. This was an excellent talk, superb as always. Such major problems in this short while. I just want to ask two questions, actually. A sort of... Um, you know, firstly, in relation to CKDU, people are sort of aware that people are implementing strategies like making sure the workers are hydrated and that they don't work in the hottest periods of the day. Has that shown any impact on the prevalence of CKDU? Why I'm asking is that I was involved with our department. Yeah, no, what I was saying is that in these sugarcane workers, there was a very aware occupational health doctor who made sure that these guidelines were implemented. The workers were given lots of water in their working day and they worked in the very early hours and by midday, the working day had stopped. So this department found very little significant kidney disease in their working cohort. So I wondered how effective this was in countries that showed large amounts of uh, CKDU. And the second question is a larger question. I think recently we've all been really struck and terrorized by the really freak weather conditions, the storms, the floods, the tsunamis. And obviously this didn't happen overnight with climate change. 
So does one see a sort of quick solution, even if every country in the world sort of uh, implements you know, climate change measures? Yeah, thanks, Sarala. I think you've asked two difficult questions. So your first one, uh, you're exactly right. I haven't seen any, uh, any conclusive study that has shown that uh, the mandatory, um, mandatory implementation of these shade breaks and hydration have led to any reduction in the incidence of uh, chronic kidney disease of uncertain etiology. And I am also very keenly looking for any such publication uh, that comes out. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, I, I, I just leave it there. I think there is no clear proof as yet, but that's that was that those measures were implemented on the back of some strong circumstantial evidence, as I said before, but we don't, we still need to see. I think the proof of the pudding lies in the eating. And so once, uh, if they are able to show that, yes, actually the prevalence decreased, that will, that will help. And the second, the larger point is, is also a good one that it didn't happen uh, overnight. And, but it's, it's, it's something that a number of, a relatively small number, a number of, but that number was relatively small. Scientists, climate scientists, et cetera, had been warning the rest of us for quite a number of years, including uh, you know even decades, but it didn't really register in our conscience. And it's just over the last five to ten years, where both as a combination of even increasing number of these events, but also uh, increase in the way we communicate, uh, more global communication. I think awareness has increased. I would say so. That is what it's uh, what, what is leading to this. Right. Um, thank you, Prof, for, for the very good answers, both Professor Sarara Naik and Vivek. Um, we are continuing to save comments or questions from the audience. And any and, and other questions or comments? We still have There's one in the chat, chat box as well. Professor Vivek, can you go through the chat box or I should read it for you? Yeah, no, no, I can. So uh, there is a question, is there any research or statistics showing the effect of climate in severity and mortality caused by AKI COVID-19? So no, the answer to that is no, there is no direct evidence to implicate climate specifically in the AKI related to COVID-19. And I doubt that uh, any such direct evidence which uh, answers this specific question uh, can be produced, but you know, the answer to that is no. The other comment is, uh, does it mean more environmental scientists, clearly enormous resources are required to tackle climate change in poor economies like most African countries? Would it be prudent to relocate the resources allocated for health budget to tackle the looming danger of climate change? Look, that's a very difficult one. I think uh, the, the, the health challenge that our countries face is real and here and now. So we can't postpone it for tomorrow. So we, it is not a binary situation that we need to spend money either on health or on climate change. It is the responsibility of our, our governments and on, uh, of our societies, both to take care of the challenge of today, the problems that the society is facing today, and also to protect the society from the looming health challenges of tomorrow, which could be related to climate change or to other issues. And that requires a lot of uh, sharing of knowledge, sharing of information, global cooperation, etc. Very good answers. Um, Dr. Lloyd, you have a comment? All right. So uh, if there's no any other comment or question, I think. Uh, that's one. Um, I, I, I was just muted. Sorry. Uh, Vivek, there's one little question. Thank you very much. Wonderful presentation. I think it's such an eye opener and a huge topic, actually. Uh, so much is actually involved. And I think. Uh, a lot of role from the government. Uh, one little question is, you no, know, uh, actually, uh, it's only today that I actually, when I looked up, you know, on the topic a bit, that I found that uh, CKDU, you know, uh, is actually involved with climate change and the, the connection. Uh, so do you think there could be uh, uh, multiple factors involved in CKDU uh, on the background of climate change? Because the heat, as, as mentioned, heat is probably one reason. Uh, so I was just wondering, you know, uh, look, Lloyd, uh, I'm actually pretty sure that there is more than one factor. Heat is just one. And yeah. heat, heat is uh, not, in, not involved only in climate change, but yeah. is likely yeah. responsible for uh, you know, uh, hastening the rate of progression in many other conditions. 
uh, yeah. and it becomes very difficult to disentangle this because it becomes part of uh, where we live and work right so how yeah. how do you actually identify that this percentage is the, is the impact of heat and this percentage is the impact of something else so it heat is just one factor we are also uh, the other hypotheses are maybe exposure to uh, pesticides uh, that these people um, who are agricultural workers might be exposed to uh, then uh, you know there are uh, there are a number of other factors also which have been hypothesized we, we just don't know so the the us nih has uh, has just put together a large global consortium of researchers of chronic kidney disease of uncertain etiology in trying to bring a number of cohorts from different parts of the world to try and answer exactly this question what is it that is causing uh, there could be genetic factors. We shouldn't discount all of that. So uh, it's it's an open question right now, Lloyd. Thank you. Thank you, Vivek. Thank you. And then one last one is the mechanism of heat. Now, recurrent AKI uh, can occur because of heat and CKD as well. CKD, uh, uh, that I didn't really understand how heat can produce CKD besides so AKI. Heat, yeah. So uh, I think I did show from in one of my slides and I can... I can actually go back and share that one again. So one is recurrent episodes of acute kidney injury and every single episode of acute kidney injury leaves some degree of uh, uh, residual damage, right? So that can happen. And that residual damage over a period of time will lead to chronic kidney disease. Yes. But then there are a number of other possible mechanisms also, which are shown on this particular slide. So there yes. is low grade rhabdomyolysis. So when yes. these people they go outdoors and work, uh, they don't drink water and they are exposed to rhabdomyolysis. They they yes. they have rhabdomyolysis, which causes kidney injury. There is hyperosmolality, and hyperosmolality also can cause kidney injury because uh, this is work done by Dr. Uh, Dr. Rick Johnson in his lab. There is endogenous fructose release. There is streptokinase stimulation, aldose reductase activation, all of which can cause kidney release. There is hyperthermia and direct heat also can directly lead to vasopressin release and reduce kidney blood flow. And of course, there is volume depletion, which can lead to renin angiotensin activation and so on. And then you can see a whole lot of other things. There is uricosuria uh, because again, because of concentration of uric acid uh, in, in the distal convoluted tubules. And these crystals can precipitate in the tubules leading to uh, kidney injury. There is hypokalemia, which causes ischemic injury. And so similarly, you know, there can, there can be many other pathophysiological mechanisms and mechanistic factors that cause kidney disease due to heat. Thank you so much, Eric. Very clear. Thank you so much. All right. right. Thank you. Yes. There's a question in the chat asking, is there a clear difference between CKDU and kidney disease related to climate change? So for my end, the question is answered, there is no. The very fact that we're still calling it CKDU means we don't know what causes it. So uh, it is uh, presumptuous to say that it is caused only by heat or it is caused only by something else. Uh, there is uh, climate change is not going to cause any disease per se. Climate change always will have indirect direct effects through heat, through uh, other changes that are described in one of one or many of the previous slides. So climate change definitely contributes and um, we need to find out what the what are the other possible mechanisms that cause kidney disease which we call ckdu we call it ckdu because we don't know we expose our ignorance thank you all right thank you prof uh, that was excellent presentation and i should i would like to thank everyone who participated in this uh, presentation uh, for professors who asked questions and comments uh, specifically, I should thank Professor Vevek for your time. As usual, you have been very helpful, and your talk has been very, very, you know, top class, and we have learned a lot. So thank you very much, and uh, that is the end of our today's presentation. Uh, we'll meet next week on Thursday, and uh, thank you. Uh, before I, I cross, uh, I would like to get one more comment uh, or Thanks from Dr. Lloyd uh, on behalf of AHN who has been you know, working behind the scenes tirelessly to make sure that uh, this presentation is successful. Dr. Lloyd. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, thank you so much Vivek, uh, uh, giving us your time again, and I'm sure you're gonna come back 
uh, many more times and uh, helping us out. Wonderful talk and you know it is a big exposition of a very important topic and actually a very innovative topic that you brought out and extremely grateful to you for having come this evening. Thank you so very much, Spirit. Thank you everyone for staying uh, with me for the whole hour.